You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Chris, good morning. Lovely to be with you. Thanks for joining us again. Okay. Good morning. I'm still trying to get my head around the name of this comet, but now I see there may be caves inside <laughs> the comet. What's that about? Yeah, well, the comet we're talking about is 67P Chiriamov Gerasimenko. Okay. And it's named after the two men who discovered it. They gave it their name. And people describe this as the bath duck comet. It looks a bit like one of those rubber ducks that goes bobbing around in your bath. It's the one that the Rosetta mission launched in 2004 by the European Space Agency has rendezvoused with back in August last year. And Rosetta, the spacecraft, has been tagging alongside this comet, which is hurtling through space at some 120,000 kilometres an hour. And it's approaching the sun and the inner solar system for the first time in its life this close in. And so Rosetta is watching what's happening to it as it comes in through our part of the solar system. So we can understand a bit more about how comets interact in this way and also learn about this comet, which has otherwise been in the deep freeze out there in what we call the Kuiper Belt, where Pluto is, ever since it formed about four and a half billion years ago. So it's an important snapshot into our solar system's origins. But one of the interesting observations that Rosetta has made so far, and it's sending back stunning images from Mm -hmm. the surface of this comet, which is about four kilometres across. There are these pits or holes in the surface of the comet in little groups or clusters around the place. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not craters. It's clear that something hasn't just come and slammed into the comet and made these holes. They're nice and round. They're about 200 metres across and about 200 metres deep as well. Very uniform. So what are they? Well, some of them are issuing dust and gassy material you can see that and the walls of them are very very sheer and the scientists who have published this work in the general nature this week they're speculating that these are sink holes in the same way that we have limestone collapse and sink holes here on earth what they're suggesting is that inside the comet is some kind of void or cave system and that the material is falling from the surface of the comet down into these caves when they collapse, probably as the comet warms up and material volatilizes off as it comes through the inner solar system. And that's why you see these little clusters of very uniform round holes. But it's intriguing to think, Mm. well, what is inside this comet that's made these voids and caves? Probably some kind of volatile material, which is perhaps being evolved off because there's maybe a heat source inside the comet or some other chemical process is driving these materials to evaporate and leave these spaces behind. But it gives us an insight into how these things form, how they evolve and what we might be able to learn from them in the future about our past. Mm, Very fascinating indeed. Thank you. Uh, We go straight to the lines. Our lines are open for you if if there's anything that you wish to ask the naked scientist or perhaps you found the answer to something we haven't answered give us a call on 021-446-0567 or double one double eight three oh seven oh two drummond in bedford view good morning good morning ready and good morning to you chris yes Uh, drummond i'd like to find out from chris how this works with this uh, potato in the bed because my wife has restless Syndrome, restless leg syndrome, and uh, it seems that it works because she tried it out and immediately her legs stopped jerking around. Where did she put why, the why potato? Why did the potato do this? Where, where was it placed? This potato um, on Pardon? the leg. Did she place the potato on her leg? Next to her leg. Yeah. Next to her leg. Oh, in the bed. In the bed. Chris. Hmm. I'm a little bit dubious to be honest Um, one is always very very cautious about drawing conclusions from a study where there's precisely one study participant who's made one or two observations Uh, you'd need to do a very big study with lots of people with with lots of examples of restless leg syndrome over a long period of time in order to establish whether there really is any veracity to these findings or whether it's just coincidence because sometimes you might have a quiet night's sleep and it coincides with when you happen to pop a potato in the bed and this leads you to conclude that the potato therefore causes your restless leg syndrome to go away when that's not in fact the case. So I'd go and do a bigger trial, try and find some more people who can participate in your trial and see Mm. if you can uh, therefore prove one way or the other if there is a consistent effect. I can't think of a biologically plausible reason why there might be, apart from the fact that perhaps something that's in the bed knocking on your leg from time to time stops you being so inclined to move your legs around but other than that, no, I'm sorry, I don't know of any evidence that this is really a Mm. true finding. And while we added, what is restless leg syndrome? 
Well, it sounds um, more flippant and uh, more trivial than it is. For people who have restless leg syndrome, it really is very trying indeed. People will say that they have an overwhelming compulsion to keep moving their legs around. They just feel that they can't sit still. It tends to be exacerbated by tiredness, and neurologists are well acquainted with this condition, and people find it extremely frustrating, and uh, especially um, it's also frustrating for people who, who have to sit around and, and live near people who have the problem because then it rubs off on them as well. Um, but we, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we do know it's a real genuine phenomenon. Let's go to uh, John in the Strand. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Rudy. I just had a question. In, in the world of sunglasses, there tends to be only polarized and, and non-polarized uh, sunglasses available. And quality aside, which is actually better for your eyes? Right, okay. The, the way that polarization works, light is a series of waves. And they can be in a range of different orientations. So if you imagine a wiggly line, and it can be a wiggly line which goes up and down between 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock. It could be a wiggly line going sideways between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. And all the possible axes around the clock face. If you have a polarizing filter, this is a, a chemical or a material which stops light going through it if the, if the waves are not in one of those orientations. So, for instance, it would stop light going through that is not going up and down between 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. It would stop light going between 9 and 3. Therefore, it will cut down the amount of light that can come through the lenses, and this reduces the intensity of light that your eye is seeing, and this makes it more comfortable to see on a bright day. But the problem is, if you put a lens in front of your eye which is darkened, your pupil will become bigger to admit more light, and that means that then you, you can still see quite well despite the fact that there's, more, there's less light coming in. But if the lens does not exclude ultraviolet rays, which many of these lenses don't, then actually you're making your eye health worse because you have mm. opened up your pupil more, and although there's less visible light coming through because of the lens there's still the same amount of ultraviolet coming in which can fog your lens and it can damage your retina. So it's very important to get a lens that is UV um, screening as well, stops the UV coming through, and this will keep your eyes healthy, but it will also, the, the knocking down the intensity will make your uh, experience more comfortable too. Thanks for that question, John. Thanks indeed. Let's go to Tuli in Melville. Hi. Hi, both. Very odd question. Assuming that there's a very light breeze, how high can a fly fly? <laughs> I love the question. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it, I, I stay pretty high because uh, even a human uh, can, can get on the, the right sorts of winds or conditions can get drawn up very, very high into the air. There was a lady who was paragliding in Queensland in northeastern Australia and a storm cloud appeared on the horizon and the updraft from that storm cloud sent her to the height of Mount Everest wow. in uh, just a, a matter of minutes and she lost consciousness, passed out and came down to earth with a bump later, survived but had frostbite and her altimeter that she had to register how high she'd been showed that she had been to about 30,000 feet. Oh, so if a human can be blown to that sort of altitude, it's almost certain that flies will as well uh, it's also intriguing for many people to realize that if you go up into the sky and you take samples of clouds people do this they fly along on airplanes and, and other devices and they have cloud catching materials and you just fly through the cloud and through the air and capture particles in the air you can find that clouds are full of dandruff you can find human dna animal dna dust dandruff and bacteria up in clouds so we know that small particles will also glow up, go you know many many kilometers up into the air so small flies right sort of draft and updraft they're so light and tiny they'll be blown way up into the air whether or not they consciously want to fly that high i'd say it's unlikely because flies need to keep close to their energy source and uh, and to protection they're not going to survive too long if they get too high and get buffeted around up there so i think it's perfectly possible they can do it um whether they do it very often i don't know though thank you very much and uh who came in first i think it was brian in Mulnerton. good morning um, hi, good morning. Uh, what I would like to ask is, um, the, that, um, with evolution, um, how evolution ties in with the um, concept of entropy, that uh, it appears to be that evolution says that things are becoming more complex, whereas entropy says that really things um, are wanting to become more chaotic. Um, so when from the, from the unicellular creatures, how they became more complex, whereas entropy would imply that they would actually become less so, I think. 
Hello, Brian. Well, I don't think that evolution is trying to make things, and I'm using the word trying in inverted commas, to make things more complicated. What evolution is doing is trying to refine things in order to make them as efficient as they possibly can be and as effective at exploiting the environment that they inhabit as they can be. Now, in some instances, yes, that means that things get together and they're a multicellular organism, but at the same time, they're still exploiting an energy flow. The sun is a giant aggregation of hydrogen which is being fused to make helium and producing a huge amount of energy in the process. This energy streams out across space, so there's a very big entropy increase because the sun is burning its hydrogen. We're in the way, so some of that energy interacts with the Earth and is captured by trees and plants, which use some of that energy to drive chemical reactions to make the plant uh, turn into wood and sugars. We eat the plant, and we then convert those sugars into things in us and so on. So there is an increase in entropy. It's just that the process is slowed down a bit because we've got in the way of that energy spreading out. It doesn't mean that ultimately things are going to change. The outcome is going to be the same. Basically, we will die, fall apart, mm -hmm. and the atoms that are in us will be returned to the ground, and the energy that we have expended will go off into space. And so space entropy will continue to grow. It's just that there is uh, a difference in... The the time it takes for some of those processes. There's, there's effectively a payoff, though, the, the big increase that the sun made when it burned the hydrogen in the first place. Mm. We had a question about Botox a couple of weeks ago, but Georgina, you want to ask something else related to Botox. What's your question? Yes, please. Morning, Reedy. Morning, Chris. Um, Chris, I've, I've suffered from Bell's palsy for the last... I've had it for about 15 years. And the older, obviously, I get, um, the, my, the, the uh, muscle tone on the one side of my face is getting progressively worse. So I was wondering, um, because they say that there's nothing that they can do about it for me. So um, I was wa wondering if Botox would perhaps help to, to um, bring the, the one side of the face back to look more like the other side, if you know what I mean. Hi, Georgina. Yeah, and I have sympathy for you because it's horrible. Mm. I've got a friend who had um, something called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, which is where you have um, chickenpox virus, and it damages the facial nerve, and yeah. uh, it can cause paralysis on one side. And so that's what Bell's palsy is. It's a, a drooping of the face on one side, uh, a slight lag in closing the eye sometimes, and if uh, a person wants to, say, puff out their cheeks to blow a trumpet, it's weaker on one side than the other. And if you say to someone, give me a nice broad smile, works on one side, and it's less good on the other. Is that the sort of thing you're having absolutely it's dreadful i would not like nothing yes more than and the problem is it creates an asymmetry in the face which is a problem for confidence because mm. then you think well my face looks different on one side than the other and and so you i can understand you saying well what about if i come along and i make the muscles on one side a bit less strong than the other i think you'd have to go and talk to someone who's a specialist in that area i would be doubtful that this is going to have very positive outcome for you because a you'd have to try and go into lots of different muscle places and you you'd have to keep repeating this because botox wears off botox wears off and i'm not sure how good the symmetrical outcome would be mm -hmm. that said Botox is pretty impressive for this sort of thing, and it might be worth exploring. I, I'm not uh, a person who knows about using it in that sort of setting, and I think it, you should go and ask someone who does work on these muscular and neuromuscular disorders to see if there's any evidence that you can achieve a cosmetic improvement um, in a Bell's palsy case like this, because the worst thing that could happen is you, you make things worse, and we don't mm, want that to happen. Mm, no, but uh, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I've not come across anyone doing that, but then I haven't really spent a lot of time working on neuromuscular disorders, so I can't advise you. Don't take my word for it. Hmm. Good luck, Georgina. It sounds uh, like such a distressing situation. Hamid in Northcliffe, good morning. Good morning. I would like to know why us, maybe as men, do not, our hair on our hands do not grow as they grow on our head and our face. So, yeah. Hi, Hamid. Um, the reason is that hair comes from what we call hair follicles. Hair follicles are little clusters of stem cells and tissue that follow a genetic program to grow, make a hair, then they stop making the hair, the hair falls out, they rest a bit, and then they start again. And the relative length of the growth phase determines how long the hair becomes. And different parts of the body have hair follicles programmed genetically to have a longer growth phase than others. So the hairs that those parts of the body produce will differ 
in how long they can become. The growth phase for a head hair is something in the region of several years, so it can grow to make a hair several years long, whereas the growth phase for an arm hair or an eyelash, an equivalent, is maybe a few weeks before the hair stops growing and then falls out, and therefore the overall total length of a hair on that part of the body is limited by that process. Thank you. Thanks, Hamid. Thank you. And is it Dez in Parkhurst? Hi there, Dez. Hi. Good morning, Rudy. Good morning, Chris. I have a very strange question. It's always concerned, well, it's always interested me. Why, how do we make paths, animals and humans? They walk, Hmm. and then they walk on the same place, and then they walk on the same place. (laughs) And there seems to be nothing in their way to make a little kink or whatever. Just don't understand. I see that with the running right, so as how well. Do, we how all do they actually? To, how yeah. do they make the path? Is that what you're asking? Is it how, yes, how they actually decide to all to follow the same there? pathway? Yes. Yeah, but there's no path to start. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think probably. We, we all are, in, animals like us, like sheep, like rabbits, like ants even, why go out and take a chance going on a new route when there's already an established safe one that someone else has taken. So we all follow a leader. We'll look to someone to take the initiative and then we follow them because then we're not placing ourselves at additional risk because if you're walking along a path and it's a safe path, then you're going to be in less danger than if you branch out and take a different route and who knows, you might fall down a hole. And for that reason, we we tend to follow where others have gone before us and you're looking for signals. Um, When animals do it, they're following smells. They're also following the fact that grass is flattened down or the plants have been flattened flattened down. We do the same thing. Trackers who track down game or track other other humans are looking for telltale signs left in the environment. Dogs have incredible noses that can smell hundreds of thousands of times better than we can and they follow the smells that rub off of us when we go along. And so one animal will pick a, a route through somewhere once a safe route is established everyone else follows because that's the safe way to go thanks des i (laughs) i'm going to uh, when i walk or it hasn't answered my question it it hasn't answered your question no okay if i if i have a flat piece of grass and i open a gate one end and a gate the other end and people start walking they don't walk in a straight line and i if i'm the first walker the next person's not going to know where i walk but suddenly after a few weeks through the path, and it, it wiggles, and it's not straight. I don't know how yes, but the, there's, a, there's a visual, um, pe- people can see that. And you will find that people default to walking where other people have walked because they slowly, as enough people walk across an area often enough, one area will get more footfall than another area and so that area will become more tramped down and there will be a visual stimulus because we're very visual as animals and we will follow that visual stimulus and so slowly people will migrate onto and converge onto one set path that they then begin to follow. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Des. Thank you very much for the question. Um, who came in first? I think it was Rendani in Kailami. Good morning to you. Morning, Rudy. Morning, Chris. Um, I recently got sick and I was wondering, why is it that when you get cold, you have a higher tendency of getting sick? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question, really. So you have a cold and then you, are you saying you get sick as in vomiting? Uh, or yes, are you like saying, people um, always tell you, um, dress warmly or else you're going to get sick. Why is that? Oh, uh, right. Well, there, there's not really any evidence that getting cold causes ill health. There's, there's a vague study that getting v- cold can have slight increases in catching certain viruses and that might be because exposure to very cold air stresses the body and dries out your mucous membranes of your nose and throat and this might mean that you are more likely to get a virus breaking in and infecting you there but there's no evidence that these old wives tales like going out with wet hair uh, will will lead to pneumonia no one no one has proved that in order to catch a bug you've got to meet with someone and mingle with someone who's got the same bug or come into contact with that bug in your environment and temperature doesn't really come into it your body temperature w- within within reasonable realms or reasonable degrees of of difference anyway if you if you get hypothermia then obviously that's a big stress for your body if you become hyperthermic mm. and too hot that's a big stress for your body but across a narrow range of temperatures it probably doesn't make a lot of difference Here's a, a tweet from Philly. He wants to know uh, why do we scratch our heads when we are confused? I don't scratch my head. Do uh, I? I think this is it's, it's interesting, and um, people do have this phrase. Um, people have been scratching their heads in answer to the following question. 
I think it's because we all copy each other and you see, see people sort of scratching their heads and then other people do it too. And it's one of those stereotypical behaviours that people then clone and copy. Uh, it, it's a sort of nervous tick reflex. You're doing something with your hands in order to perhaps stimulate your brain. We know that the motor areas of our brain, where we coordinate movements, are right next door to the front part of the brain that does your higher executive and reasoning functions. And sometimes there's, well, there is evidence that if you activate the motor parts of your brain, some of that activation spills over into the adjacent brain areas that are concerned with these sorts of thinking tasks and can help to facilitate or promote activity in that area. And it's interesting, there was a study done recently where they were looking at children who have ADHD, attention, uh, hyperactivity de um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and they found that the kiddies who were moving around and, and being hyperactive actually focused and concentrated better than mm -hmm. when they were made to sit still and that what's happening is that there's probably a, a problem at the front of the brain focusing and that by moving around and being overactive they, they're actually helping to increase the activity in the part of the brain that they need in order to do thought processes and that's why they behave like that and it, it's probably this is something similar your your hand occupies a huge amount of territory in your brain in the motor area mm -hmm. and so activating your hands and scratching your head which also has a huge amount of territory probably does help to facilitate and stimulate the front part of your brain that's just my own conjecture so if anyone knows a better reason do tell me okay uh, it's time to scratch our heads now and search for the answer. <laughs> Chris, we'll speak, like, we'll speak to you again next week. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it already. Lovely. Thanks, really. Cheers, then. Definitely bye -bye. going to podcast this conversation with Chris as we always do. Just go on the website, it's always there.